Uh, thank you, Ryan. And I don't see Arthur, but Arthur, wherever you are, thank you as well. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, and speaking at a Claremont Institute event, uh, particularly on a topic as important as uh, we are now all coming to realize very quickly woke capitalism is. Uh, it, and it, this, for me, this is one of those horrific experiences where you are on a panel and there are a bunch of people who speak before you and they say about two thirds of what you wrote down to say. Uh, so, I, <laughs> so a lot of this is just going to be off the cuff. Uh, it'll be just between us and it'll be a very uh, personal conversation because my uh, written remarks have become uh, less pertinent than they were at uh, nine o'clock this morning. I'm going to start with something nobody's done yet, which is quote Ronald Reagan, because how could we have one of these conferences if we didn't quote Ronald Reagan? But, and from a speech at Hillsdale College uh, back in 1977, it was called What Happened to Free Enterprise? And if you haven't read the speech, read the speech. It's incredible. You could take that speech, 43 years old, you could change maybe a dozen words and give it today, and it would be just as impactful today as it was back in 1977. But one of the things he asked, he asked, have great corporations, have they abdicated their responsibility to preserve the freedom of the marketplace out of a fear of retaliation or reluctance to rock the boat? He says, if they have, they're feeding the crocodile, hoping he'll eat them last. And I think that's much of what we see out there with America's CEOs today. And there are a bunch of different reasons. I, I think the really to understand how a CEO would look at this. And when I was, I was CEO of CKE restaurants, as Ryan said, we had about uh, 4,000 restaurants in 45 states and 40 foreign countries. We did about $4 billion as a system the last year I was there. Uh, we were a New York Stock Exchange company uh, and from 2000 when I took over until 2010, and then we were owned by a private equity firm. So, I, so I've got some experience in what, at least back in the 2000s, would motivate a CEO to take a position on an issue one way or another. And I can tell you, they're, they're really, to look at, to, to understand how CEOs would look at what's going on, you really need to go back to why we have corporations in the first place. And we have corporations because obviously they provide a liability shield, which allows people to invest and their total risk is what they invest. They're not investing everything they ever owned or everything they might own like a business owner. They're investing, their risk is just what they invest. Uh, and that encourages people to invest because if we don't have that kind of protection, we generally tend to put our money under a mattress and money being a depreciating asset, that's not where you want it to go. You want to invest with somebody who will protect your investment and maximize the returns on that investment so that your, your money becomes worth more. Now that, that's all pretty simple and I know you all knew that, uh, but this stakeholder capitalism, ESG investing, woke capitalism, this, is, this, is a, um, this strikes at the heart of our capitalist system. Uh, it, it does so by imposing non-economic obligations on American businesses. Uh, it, it reduces the focus on profit, and in doing so, reduces the incentive to invest, and therefore the capital available for growth. So over time, this will have a, an extremely negative impact, and it has the most negative impact for working and middle class families, because it means fewer jobs and lower paying jobs. So, why would we walk away from the system? You know, it's been incredibly successful, right? In inspiring people to make a profit has lifted billions of people out of poverty in capitalist countries and modern economies. I mean, the, the environments are better, the healthcare systems are better, the education systems are better, the standard of living is better, GDP per capita is, is far superior. Why would we walk away from that? Well, I, there's really not a good reason to walk away from it. And it's a little spooky that we're even considering walking away from it. And I think it's a result of, of people, I'll call them collectivists. Uh, it's a certain mentality. But, you know, we would, in Reagan's day, we'd have called them, just called them communists, but they keep changing their name. They're communists, progressives, uh, I don't know, whatever you want to call them. It's kind of ridiculous. Now they're called Democrats. I mean, you know, it's whatever you want to call them. Um, but back, back in those days, you know, communism, the, the major tenet was the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie, and this is how you generated support, was you, you, you know, the workers of the world, the bourgeoisie was to unite. It was the, uh, the uh, benevolent socialist versus the, uh, the greedy capitalist. Well, that, that, they've kind of taken that, which didn't work in the economy. I mean, we all know that just didn't work. It's an abject failure every place it's been tried. And they're trying to move that sort of to the social sphere. So that you now have 
the woke and the unwoke, the right and the wrong. You're, if you're not woke, you're wrong. And it's really just taking that same sort of tenet that they thought would move forward in the economic system and moving it into the social system. And as it penetrates corporations, there, there, are, there are different things that motivate CEOs. You know, normally you would think, well, as a CEO, you're motivated initially, you want investment in your company, so you want a profitable company, you want to convince people it's profitable, so they'll invest with you, and you'll have the capital to grow. After you get your capital, and let's say you're a publicly traded company, at that point in time, you want the stock to go up, you want people to invest, because when the stock goes up, your worth goes up. Your CEOs generally own a good portion of the company, or they have options, or some other incentive that drives them to try and increase the value of those shares. Now, there's, there's two things, there's two ways that that's being attacked. The first is, and, and a, lot of, a lot of the earlier um, speakers and discussed how the left gets together and, 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 and will uh, boycott or threaten CEOs so that their, their business, uh, they, they want to step back and say, you know, God, leave us alone, or at least appear like they're they're uh, doing whatever they're being asked to do by these, uh, by these woke leftist boycotters uh, or people that are protesting, or you want to stay out of there, you want to stay out of their sight, you want them not to be picking on you. And I, and I tell you, that, that kind of bothers me less than the second threat, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, because I, I do think we actually counter that threat. I do think we step up, uh, and, and increasingly so recently. You know, if you if you adopt these leftist policies, that is a threat to your business. And I'll give you a few very public examples. Let's take the Oscars. 23.6 million viewers a couple years ago, under 10 million this year. I mean, God, can you even watch a movie anymore, without, or a TV show, without getting depressed? I mean, I, without having your values insulted? I mean, nobody wants to watch these, these shows. I, I went to the Oscars, I mean, I don't know, maybe it was five, 10 years ago. It must have been at least over five, because I retired five years ago. And they brought Michelle Obama in to speak. I, you know, I, of course, they never asked Melania Trump to come in and speak. And to my knowledge, they never asked Laura Bush to come in and speak. But Michelle Obama, I, you know, I didn't want to be at the Oscars hearing Michelle Obama speak. I wouldn't want to be anywhere hearing her speak, quite honestly. <laughs> but the politics of this, you know, and then you've got, you're gonna, we're going to hear from J.D. Vance today, a hillbilly elegy. Look, in, in a saner time, in the time of Chariots of Fire, or, or A Man for All Seasons, or Ben-Hur, you know, that, that movie would have been in there for the Oscars. But it, it doesn't relate to any of us anymore. So we stop, even, even all the great looking celebrities on the red carpet, we just stopped watching. The NFL, I mean, their viewership is down to levels that they haven't seen, by some estimates, uh, going back to 1969 when Joe Namath was, uh, was in the Super Bowl. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have, they were down, this is, their ratings were down the lowest since 2006, and some metrics the lowest since 1969. The NBA, their ratings are down 45% from the 2011 and 12 season on ABC and 40% on TNT. But it's not just these, these very public uh, entities, you know, that really aren't shareholder type companies. There's also shareholder companies. Look at Disney. Disney fires that, that wonderful actress that was in the, the Mandalorian, I can't remember her name. Um, but they fired her, they went woke on diversity training, and strangely enough, about a week and a half ago, it was announced that Disney didn't meet what the analysts said its subscriber, uh, its new subscriber goals would be, and their stock went down. Well, you know, look, I canceled my subscription as soon as they fired that actress from The Mandalorian, whose name I can't even remember, but I called and canceled the subscription. I don't know how many people canceled, but obviously not as many people were signing up because they've insulted part of their uh, their base of potential um, uh, purchasers. Uh, Coke is probably the best example. Now, Coke, uh, they went very woke on this diversity training. I don't know if you remember, a lot of people, I, you know, we used to, we, we were Coke's sixth largest, uh, 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 what do they call it? The, uh, we bought the syrup from them. We were their sixth largest purchaser, I think, in the world at, at one point in time. Uh, and a lot of the people I know at Coke called and were very upset about this diversity training. Uh, and then they went out and got woke on the Georgia voting law. Uh, well, as of April 21st, Rasmussen came out with a poll that said 37% of uh, the American public would buy fewer Coke products because of the positions that Coke had been taking. Well, I gotta tell you, as a CEO, the last thing you wanna see is a poll that says 37% 
of the public is less inclined to buy your products. Uh, and in fact, on May 4th, about two weeks later, the uh, chief legal counsel for Coca-Cola, who had implemented these diversity training programs uh, and, and probably had a lot to do with what happened on the Georgia law, uh, mysteriously resigned. And Coke also announced that it was backing off on this aggressive diversity program. So we can have an influence on these companies. We can't have an influence as consumers. Uh, we can't have an influence as conservatives if we just kind of back off. This is why companies don't generally, in my day, you didn't want to take an aggressive position, unless you're like Starbucks or Patagonia, where you take an aggressive position because, you know, your customers are people that like that position. Uh, you know, or the NFL, which would, you would think would make you take a more patriotic beer drinking type position, because uh, that's the people that generally watch NFL games, but apparently the NFL was unaware of that uh, and walked away from the majority of, its, um, of, of people who watch those games. So what, what's the bigger threat? The bigger threat to me is um, uh, the asset management firms such as BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, that, that create demand for your stock if you're a CEO. You know, the reason you want to be profitable is because you want demand for your stock, right? You want people to want your stock because when there's demand, the stock goes up. If there's no demand, the stock goes down. And so it, when, the, when, the, when you can drive the price of your stock up by being profitable and being focused on being profitable, as Milton Friedman, you know, preached, companies' uh, primary responsibility is to their shareholders to generate returns consistent with law and ethical custom, which of course means you shouldn't do things that are illegal and it's okay to contribute to charities. But your primary focus should be on profitability for the company. And of course that involves these other stakeholder elements. I, there, there is no company in the country, I'm gonna tell you right now in case any of you have never been in business or have been living under a rock, it, it, you, there is no company in the country that doesn't pay attention to its employees. You don't pay attention to making your employees happy. You go out of business because your employees go to your competitor. There's no company in the country that doesn't pay attention to the people in its supply chain. Because if you don't pay attention to people in the supply chain, they're gonna supply your competitors and they're not gonna give you preferential treatment. And there's no company in the country that doesn't make at least some charitable contributions to the community. Last year, there was $21 billion contributed by American corporations um, uh, taking advantage of the charitable tax deduction because it's good to help the community. And it, it does, in fact, help your reputation as a company and, and is in the interest of your shareholders. So when you can drive the price of your stock by focusing on profitability, and if we can as uh, conservatives, or you don't have to be conservative, you could be um, a libertarian, just somebody who doesn't want companies focused on these woke issues. If we reject companies that become very woke, that, that's gonna have an effect on them. Now, it might not have an effect on Nike because they're appealing like Patagonia or or let's say Starbucks, to a more leftist type clientele. They're into you know, these younger people that are still buying their products. So you're gonna have companies that do that, but you're not gonna have the vast majority of companies doing that. So what's the big problem? Well, the problem is, let, let's take BlackRock, and I, I hate to pick on Larry Fink, but, but maybe I will anyway. He, um, you know, uh, BlackRock votes is either the first, second, or third largest shareholder in 80% of the companies on, in the S&P 500. Wow. And that doesn't include Vanguard and State Street. And it doesn't include the other 50 top asset managers that control $60 trillion in assets. And when BlackRock or one of these other asset managers goes to vote their, the shares on, um, on particular shareholder proposals, you know, Justin's out there fighting this battle by himself. Talk about David and Goliath. I mean, you know, this is... Uh, this is, this is a horrific situation. You know, there are, last, in, so far this proxy season, according to the Wall Street Journal, a BlackRock voted in favor of 91% of shareholder resolutions on the environment. You, you know, but they're not voting their shares. They're voting shares they hold for all of us. I'll bet almost all of you have a mutual fund, and it's probably one of the BlackRock funds. It's probably in your investment portfolio. They vote. For, for middle and working class Americans who have pension funds, 401ks, IRAs, who simply want a peaceful retirement, right? But they're voting their shares uh, uh, in favor of these woke uh, ESG criteria, you know, environmental, social, governance, investment criteria, 
that these 50 large asset managers have adopted. And if they're not investing in the most profitable companies, they're in effect taxing their investors to accomplish their social goals because they're reducing returns. And, you know, I, you know nobody, nobody from a mutual fund ever called me and asked me if I was uh, in favor of uh, reducing my returns in favor of these, you know, protecting uh, the environment or having major diversity programs at, at the company. I didn't, nobody elected, you know, Larry Fink and his ilk uh, to, as politicians uh, to, to try and enact the, these kinds of policies. You know, Larry Fink actually said recently in uh, a letter he sent out, I think it was to uh, the uh, companies that they invest in, where he talked about this environmental, the E part of ESG, and said it's going to require that we, to, to get to carbon neutrality by 2050, it would require that we fundamentally transform the economy. I, you know, I didn't elect this guy to fundamentally transform the economy. I didn't vote for, did anybody else vote for him to fundamentally transform the economy of the United States? So when, when they're out there voting these shares, when they're voting these shares as this huge block, well, the, you know, you may be able to try and hide from consumers and, and look neutral and not offend anybody. You're not gonna, you, you can't hide from these guys. You know, they're out there, you know, you know, Justin could tell you, they're out there voting in favor of these various proposals uh, and, uh, and, and it's not in your interest as an investor. Uh, so what kind of, let, let's talk for a minute about what kind of CEOs we have because I think we've been talking this morning about CEOs generally. Um, and as though, as though everybody thinks the same. And, and there are different kinds of CEOs. I think, one, they're true believers. They're the ones that want the revolution. You know, they probably run the tech companies. Um, uh, you know, and there are some that run these uh, asset management firms where they're, they're using other people's money to accomplish their social objectives, uh, you know, like the heads of BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street. But they're the true believers. And I don't think much we do is gonna influence them. Then there are those who just want to be on the right side of history. They're, you know, they've, they've been convinced that this wokeness is the right side of history. Um, I wish some of them were a little older because I could re remember when uh, I was a, a, young, a young lawyer prior to uh, Ronald Reagan taking office. This is back in 1978 I became a lawyer. When, look, people were telling us, uh, I, Jimmy Brzezinski, uh, I think it was, a, uh, was Carter's Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense. National Security Advisor, thank you. Came out and said, you know, X number of countries have converted from, uh, uh, from democracy to capitalism since the end of World War II, and no countries have converted from uh, democracy, to, oh, excuse me, X number of countries have converted from democracy to communism since the end of World War II, and no countries have converted from uh, communism or a, a dictatorship to democracy. Uh, and, uh, and we just have to accept the fact that the future is communism, that communism is going to be present, we're just going to have to deal with it. Well, of course, you know, 10 years later, we brought down the Berlin Wall and, uh, and things changed. So the way that intellectuals, the way that people view the his history or uh, getting on the right side of history isn't always how you get on the right side of history. Our capitalism has been re relatively successful over the past 200 some years. Third, there are those whose shareholders' interests are served by woke capitalism. I used Patagonia and Starbucks as examples. and. You know, they're going to go out there and say things that appeal to their consumers. And then I think there's the majority of CEOs. They're the ones that are just bullied into doing this. They would prefer to be focused on, on, on running companies that are profitable. They'd, be, they'd, be, they'd prefer not to have to deal with these woke issues. Uh, you know, it's tough enough to, to try and make a company profitable without worrying about whether Larry Fink's going to come down on you because you're not environmentally friendly. I mean, even Warren Buffett, you know, who's a fairly powerful CEO over uh, a company that owns a lot of other companies, um, was uh, obviously nervous or upset about, uh, about what BlackRock was doing with these environmental requirements uh, and, and stood up to him, uh, you know, good for him, he stood up to him in the last shareholders meeting. So there are things that, there are things you can do as a consumer. What then can we do about these, um, uh, about these asset managers, and yeah, really they control so much. Uh, we, and, and part of it's, I think, that the fact that a lot of us really didn't, be, didn't awaken, I hate to use the word become woke, but a lot of us didn't awaken to the fact that this was happening until recently. And I, I, um, 
I think the Georgia voting law controversy was a big help in that respect. But it's been really over the last five months, six months, that I've become aware of this. I know when the business roundtable came out and said, well, we gotta, we're, no, we're, gonna be, we're gonna focus on, I don't know, they listed six things, and shareholders were last, you know, our employees, our community, our, our supply chains. And I, you know, I just thought it was bullshit. I, you know, these guys are putting that out there because they want everybody to think that's what they're doing. But we all know that they're going to be trying to make their companies more profitable. And if this helps them, gives them little cover so they can hide, uh, then so be it. I, I really didn't have a great perspective on the power that was wielded by fund managers out in the stock market. And I'm, I'm not sure why I didn't, but I didn't. Um, and I was, I, I, I think we've, we've, we're at least starting to address that. There was an article in the uh, Wall Street Journal this morning, and it actually it came out literally as I was walking out of my hotel room door to come down here this morning. An article came out called Trump Allies Promote Portfolios Targeting Unwoke Investors. And it's about something called Second Vote Advisors, uh, which is something I'm involved with. Uh, Kevin Hassett, the former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors uh, for President Trump, uh, the, the individual who set up the S&P 500, the, the individual that ran uh, the investment portfolio at the University of Chicago, and, and two or three other individuals with doctorates in economics have set up a fund uh, that's called Second Vote Advisors. I'll tell you why it's called Second Vote in a minute. But the, I, so far, there are two publicly traded ETFs. Uh, one is a Second Amendment uh, border security fund, uh, the call signals EGIS. And the other is a pro-life fund. It's called it's L Y F E, uh, and these um, these ETFs, for example, let's use the Second Amendment ETF uh, as an example. Uh, if you invest in the Second Amendment ETF, there's no guarantee that you will have companies that advocate for Second Amendment rights. This isn't like a pure anti-ESG uh, approach to investing. The only guarantee is that you won't have any. Uh, companies in that group that, that, that oppose Second Amendment rights. You won't have activists in support of them, but you won't have any that oppose them. And in fact, about 90% of the companies in these ETFs are neutral. Uh, and once you, you come up with a universe of companies out of the S&P 1500 that, uh, that don't support, or that, that don't oppose Second Amendment rights, then the, there's an analysis applied that finds the most profitable companies. We want companies that focus on profits. Uh, not, our investment theory is, is very simple. We think companies that focus on profit make more profit than companies that don't. And companies that don't being companies that focus on ESG type investing. Uh, and so far, and it's in the journal this morning, so far the results have been pretty good from foundation back in November of last year through the end of first quarter. Uh, I think the, 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 uh, the life funds up about 14%, the, uh, the Second Amendment funds up about 18%, and the s and is up about 10.8%. So I mean, so far, you know, the, the idea of investing in companies that are profitable has worked. We also have some indexes that we're going to be providing. Hopefully this will appeal to some red state pension funds. You know, for example, if you're in Louisiana and you happen to be the treasurer and you're a big Second Amendment advocate, maybe you don't want to invest with banks or investment advisors that won't invest in gun manufacturers or munition companies or companies that actually oppose Second Amendment rights. So we're hoping to generate some support there. And the idea will be that once we get these funds up to where they've got some, uh, they've got assets under management sufficient to make a difference, and now we've got about 25 million, which, you know, that's not a lot compared to the 60 trillion that these other people have. Uh, but it's up from just a couple of million just a few months ago. So it's, it, it, it's really started to pick up. And we will then use the influence that we have in those funds to try and bring uh, those companies into line. A lot of what, what Justin does, but hopefully with a little more influence than Justin currently has. And, you know, Justin's familiar with the people involved in this and well has been working with them. So it's not like it's a completely different track. But we'd like to build up assets under management sufficient to make a difference so we can go in and encourage these companies to be neutral on some of these issues and to focus on what they should focus on, which is you know, making a profit, producing returns for investors. Uh, you know, there was a, uh, uh, I, I, and I don't know if Michael knows him or not, there was a, a guy named Tariq Fancy who implemented a lot of these ESG policies at BlackRock and he had an article in USA Today, uh, I don't know, it was a month or so ago, uh, critical of 
certain companies because they, he calls it greenwashing, where they try and fake that they're environmentally friendly. Uh, and, and he admits it, they try and fake it because uh, companies that are environmentally friendly just aren't, don't produce as good a return as companies that don't focus on being environmentally friendly. Uh, and then he also admits, of course, that uh, the reason asset managers do that is because their primary responsibility to their investors is to produce a profit. Uh, so that, for example, these retirement funds have enough money to fund the retirements of the people that invested in them. So there are, again, the, the, the point here is if you're, if you're a CEO, you're going to be looking to your customers. You don't want to offend your customers. You want a, a customer base that will buy your products. If you're Coca-Cola, you know, that's the whole world. If you're Starbucks, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a more limited group, or if you're Patagonia. But how do you satisfy these huge and super powerful um, investment, uh, investment firms that manage such an incredible amount of assets and may end up owning such an incredible amount of your stock? Even small amounts of stock. I, you know, Justin talked about he goes in with a few shares. When I ran CKE restaurants, we used to have PETA come in and they would buy, I don't know, five shares of, of stock and come in and argue that we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't use beef. What well, was a hamburger company? Yeah, I, I, I mean, how, you know. So we, 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 at the time, we just we we said thank you very much for your input and sort of told them to kiss off. But the um, but I, I think a lot of CEOs out there right now are in a position where they're forced to feed the crocodile, hoping he will eat them last. And uh, I hope I'm hoping we can do things, we can get things going in the investment community that offers CEOs the alternative to say. You know, as Nancy Reagan said, just say no. You know, some of this stuff we're just not going to do. We're focused on our investors and on making a profit.